Now remember the cluster validation wizard. If we right click here on the cluster name itself, we can actually view that validation report again. Because remember, I mentioned we may want to look over it at a later time or we may want to send it off to support if we need assistance with our cluster. So it's easy to grab right here. In the future, this is where I could also add new nodes or other actions like configure cluster quorum settings. By default, the cluster create wizard does a really good job of setting up the quorum settings. But if you have something specific, you can go through and make these changes shut down my cluster or destroy my cluster. If I want to take this cluster offline permanently, I can choose destroy cluster. It will free up all my resources and eliminate the whole cluster configuration, freeing up that IP address as well. And this is also where we configure cluster aware updating. We'll cover that in another session. Now that my cluster is set up, let's go inspect our nodes, storage, and networks. So as you can see, we have the two nodes set up. We don't have any roles added yet. We'll add roles in a few minutes. Our storage shows our disks. Cluster disk 1, and notice how it's labeled CSV1. It's 401 gig, remember the one I talked about, and it's cluster disk 1. Now I'm going to make this a CSV volume, so I'll go ahead and add it to cluster shared volumes here. One of the things I want to point out, if you're accustomed to server 08R2, remember we had to go over to the cluster name and enable cluster shared volumes. We no longer have to do that. Cluster shared volumes are enabled by default. Now in 08R2 we did that because cluster shared volumes were only for virtualization. We didn't want to use cluster shared volumes for storage or other things. In Server 2012 we've eliminated that restriction. So now you can use cluster shared volumes for shared storage. My disk 2, I also want to make a cluster shared volume. So I'll just go ahead and say add this to cluster shared volumes. And when I do that, you'll notice here in a minute that the drive letter will disappear from disk 2, just like it did from disk 1. And now we have a mount point. So this volume mount point is the same for all of my servers in the cluster. Something to remember, by default, Windows installs to the C drive. That's its OS drive. I would encourage you not to change that because every server in your cluster needs to have the same OS drive because of this volume mount point because your configurations will point to C colon backslash cluster storage backslash volume and the volume name. If you have one node in your cluster that's say configured with D or G or something else as the root OS volume, your mount points won't work properly. So these are disks. We have storage pools as well that we could use in storage. Storage pools give us the ability to virtualize storage, actually making Windows give you some of the capabilities of SANS like virtualized storage, now I can create a whole bunch of pools, thinly provision some disk space, and then add to it as I need to. I'm not going to spend time on storage pools today. We'll come back to that in another session. But I do want to talk a little bit more about my witness disk. So what I do is go ahead and rename this to witness. That way I don't ever forget what it is. So I'll do that naming, and then we'll move down to networks. So when I look at my three networks, notice my cluster use, internal, disable, and enabled. So when I look at this, internal, this allows cluster network communication on this network. It's not externally visible, so it's just the network between my nodes, which I'll use for live migration. I'll show you that in a minute. My network number two, this will actually be my iSCSI subnet. 12.0 is where my iSCSI is set up. And so I don't want to use this for cluster network communication, nor do I want to make this public. This is just for my iSCSI. And then my cluster network 3, this is my 0.0, which is my public network. I can allow cluster communication here, and I can allow clients to connect through this network. This is my host node. I also want this as a backup network, again, in the order so that it's used lowest priority. When we move over here to live migration settings, this defines the network order for live migration. And as you can see, this network order is backwards. So cluster network 3, my 0.0, I actually want that least important. I want my cluster network 1 at top. That's my 13.0. I want live migration to happen there first. My iSCSI network second. Not a big fan of it happening there, but the last place I want it to happen is in my public network. So now I've set that order. Now that we've talked about the networks, let's move back up to roles and add some roles to our cluster. 
Now when we look at roles, we can configure roles or we have a virtual machine specific option for a new virtual machine or a new hard disk. I've already created some virtual machines. I can flip over here and show you three of them on this node and the rest of them on this other node. If you noticed when I went through the drives on my cluster, CSV1 was already over half full. I'd already configured some VMs to add. Now they're showing up on each host. So moving back over to Failover Cluster Manager, if I go in here and configure role, it lets me define which roles I want to configure for high availability. DFS namespace, DHCP server. Now DHCP server, I can cluster it. That's for legacy support. But in server 2012, we actually have a new DHCP configuration where I can replicate between two DHCP servers to give me some redundancy and fault tolerance. I can define a file server here if I want. Generic applications, servers, scripts. The Hyper-V replica broker. I talked about that with the Hyper-V replica video. But what this does is says, let me define a destination for replicas sent to this cluster. Because if we think about a Hyper-V cluster, we've got multiple nodes for high availability, right? If I have replicas coming into a specific server and that server goes down, replicas can't come in. But in a cluster, if I set up this replica broker, then all of my replicas are pointed to that broker. And if I add or remove nodes or a node fails in my cluster, another node takes over the duties of the replica broker and still receives these replicas inbound. A nice SCSI target server. So I could make a Windows server or a Windows server cluster look very much like a SAN and create high availability from a storage perspective to the point that with SMB 3.0, the new version of server message block in server 2012, we actually have a highly available share. Let's say the node that's hosting that file share actually fails or that iSCSI target. It can fail over to another node in the cluster, keeping all file handles open. Connections don't have to be reestablished. Again, we could now use a clustered server configuration as a file share hosting our virtual hard drives. It could be our redundant shared storage. For this example, though, we're going to choose virtual machine. It will enumerate all of the virtual machines that are available to be added to the cluster. I've gone ahead and selected all of the virtual machines. Choose next. It'll confirm that's what I intend to do. And now it'll configure these 17 virtual machines. And in a two node cluster, I want to make sure that all of the roles I configure for high availability, they could all be supported on a single node if that second node were to fail. And what I've actually done is sized all these virtual machines to fit on one of my nodes. The downside in a two node cluster would be totally highly available means that I'm only utilizing 50% of the resources. But if I'm doing like VDI, virtual desktops, we actually have a way to overcome that as well. So I can take best advantage of both nodes. But if we lose a node, I can still give you great performance and all of the capabilities to all of your virtual desktops. We'll cover that at another time. Now that all these virtual machines have been added, we can actually scroll through and look at success for all of them. Choose Finish, and there are all my virtual machines. Now that we have this Windows cluster, all of these workloads will be configured as highly available. The great part about the cluster is if I lose a physical node, the other nodes, or in my case, node in the cluster, will pick up those dead virtual machines and restart them and put them back to work. That's all I wanted to cover today. I hope this has been helpful, and I look forward to talking to you again soon.